Please let's take our seats. <clears throat> Madam Chief Justice and President of our Supreme Court, uh, Madam Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Emeritus, the Honorable Willie Mutunga, and the Honorable David Maraga, Chief Justices from various parts of our continent, um, Judges of the Supreme Court, distinguished judicial officers from different parts of our continent, ladies and gentlemen, and our visitors, good morning and welcome. Welcome to Nairobi and welcome to Kenya. I join Madam Chief Justice for uh, the convener of this uh, symposium in welcoming you to both Nairobi and, and Kenya. Let me volunteer some information about Nairobi and about Kenya. About Nairobi, um, this is the city that has a national park within 10 minutes from your hotel. So you may find some lion or cheetah because sometimes they escape from the national park. <laughs> Please be careful because they are not domesticated. Uh, welcome to Kenya. And again, on this one, I speak uh, with the authority of a scientist, being a scientist myself, that science has proved that Kenya is the cradle of mankind. You may find yourself having this feeling that you are more at home here <laughs> than from where you come from. <laughs> Please understand that this is where we all started and we can tell you welcome home. <clears throat> and it is inspiring to be here to witness Africa's judicial leadership as you mobilize your judicial authority, intellectual power, and moral commitment to intervene in our generation's defining struggle. I am highly encouraged to note the depth of thought in your appreciation of the existential magnitude of climate change and of the imperative for urgent action by all stakeholders anchored on common institutional coordination. Although climate change is a universal existential threat, there is good reason for Africa's institutions and leadership to drive the agenda of mitigating its effects and eliminating the human activity that is driving it. The first reason is the fact that Africa is by far the least polluting continent, yet it is by far the most adversely affected by climate change. The entirety of industrial and economic activity from all of the continent's economies contributes less than 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. These emissions are the cause of a steady and dangerous rise in global temperatures which have resulted in the extinction of plants and animal species, rise in sea levels, disruptions in climate patterns, drought, and desertification. The brunt of these adverse effects and impacts has been borne by vulnerable African populations residing in less developed parts of the world. Droughts are more frequent and more severe. Our region has undergone a five season long drought which has decimated domestic and wild animal populations, wiped out food crops, 
disrupting and threatening the lives of millions of people. Water stress caused by climate change has been devastating both directly and as a driver of conflict over water and pastures. Poverty has been exacerbated by loss of livestock, which forms the mainstay of pastoralist economy, economic livelihoods, and massive crop failure, which weakened the foundations of farming economies. In addition to drought, African populations are experiencing floods, heat waves, and outbreak of climate change-related diseases. African livelihood, security, and development is in danger and will remain at stake unless we collectively wage aggressive combat to reverse the situation through policies and other institutional action to implement mitigation, enhance adaptation, and build resilience. The looming climate disaster is particularly tragic for Africa, which is entering a new promising era of peace and prosperity as the continent of the future. Many vital indicators have found that indeed Africa is rising, powered by its youthful population, energy, resources, and hope. It is important for Africa to undertake concerted action to win the war on climate change because it is disproportionately affected by its ad adverse impacts and also because necessary global responses to climate change are going to institute structural change. The institutional configurations and economic resets emanating from this structural change will install Africa not only as a continent of the future, but as the world's green economic superpower. Africa is abundantly endowed with all the resources required to power green industrialization. Our clean and green power potential is incomparable. Just to give you indications, 92% of our grid in Kenya is clean and green. It is the case in many other African countries and the potential to make it the case in many African nations is real and is possible. Our clean and green power potential, as I said, is immense. Hydro, geothermal, wind, and solar power potential is super abundant. The mineral resources needed for green energy technology also exists plentifully in our continent. We are the world's youngest continent with a mean age of 25 and growing younger every year. Our people constitute a three billion strong market and a pool of skilled, motivated and capable workforce. Future global sustainability will depend on a robust engagement with Africa in many fundamental ways. The world knows this, and African institutions and stakeholders must be ready for this engagement. And that is why this symposium is very important. I am very proud of the firm commitment demonstrated by the African Union in this matter. At COP27, which was held last November in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, Africa's voice was clear. The development path taken by the world's economic and industrial powers is unsustainable and prejudicial to Africa and the global south. Climate change has brought home that fact in sobering detail. Africa is emphatic that although prosperity is an urgent goal to liberate our people from the indignity of poverty and inequality, the path of pollution is not an option. The African Union prefers a more ecologically responsible industrialization, one that promotes 
multi-sectoral climate resilience in agriculture and food systems, water resources, energy, transport and infrastructure, among others. We also insist quite firmly that international development financing must be more appropriate for the needs of our existential moment in terms of how much resources is accessible, affordable, and adequate. In February, I was encouraged to witness the impressive level of, of activity accomplished by African group of negotiators, especially at COP27, as well as the various African climate change initiatives. The Committee of African Heads of State and Governments on Climate Change, which I chair, also coordinates various African climate change commissions that are doing extremely important work in many regions of our continent to implement the Africa climate change and green recovery agenda. I'm also honored to lead Kenya's participation in these regional, continental, and climate actions. It is a privilege to join our African brothers and sisters in this good fight and make our contribution to the defining struggle of our generation. Africa is alive to the imperative of this moment in a way that is simply inspiring. I will share with you Kenya's experience of this journey so far. From the very inception, our aspirations for economic development and shared prosperity has been inextricably tied to a firm commitment to environmental sustainability. In my earlier statement, I did paint the picture of where we are as a continent. I mean, the power of industrialization that has been premised on fossil fuels, despite its adverse its effects, is what has driven industrialization in the world so far. The world today is at a crossroads. The crossroads being, do we continue the fossil fuel powered industrialization, which is destroying our globe with disastrous effects, or do we go green? I think that decision is no longer a decision that we are waiting to make. It is an existential threat that faces us as humanity, and the option is already made for us that we can only go green. Why Africa is in a pivotal position as we go green is because, number one, Africa has the highest reserves and potential for green energy, whether it is geothermal, wind, solar, hydro. No other part of the world has the resources we have. Number two, we have the resources in our continent, the mineral resources, the natural resources, for green energy technology. Number three, we have the greatest potential for green, sustainable agriculture and food production because two-thirds of the world's uncultivated arable land is in Africa. And number four, we have the youngest population, energetic, innovative, creative, and in any case, a quarter of the world's population will live in the African continent by 2050. So if you are looking for the people to work for this globe, for humanity, whether you like it or not, they will be in the African continent. Forget about the small migration that is happening now from Africa. Shortly, I promise you, 
the migration will be in the opposite direction. Very short. The only thing that stands between us and the huge potential we have in this continent. And I want to encourage you as Chief Justices of our continent, the only thing that stands between us and this huge potential is a financial system that was designed to serve a different time. And that is why we are insisting that we must rethink the international financial system to align it with the reality and the imperative of this moment. It is not sustainable anymore for us, the IMF and the World Bank and the International Financial Institution in its current configuration. And we are not saying we want an international financial system that is favorable to Africa. No. We want an international financial system that is fair to everybody. <laughs> Having a fair international financial system is not asking for too much. I think it's just asking for what is fair. We want to access development resources at the same rate as everybody else is. It is a fallacy for anybody to imagine that it is possible to grow any part of the world to the, ex uh, to the exclusion of any other part of the world. Because whether we like it or not, we share this globe. And if today anybody imagines that climate change is affecting the global south more than the global north, it won't, be, it won't be for long. Shortly, we will all either float or sink. So the sooner we have a fair international financial system that makes it possible for us as humanity to exploit all the resources available to us in a sustainable manner, the better for all of us as humanity. The sooner we get ourselves there, the better. As a continent, we want to have a conversation that is balanced. Even as we demand for a fair international financial system, Africa will be coming to the table with our assets. We will not be coming to the table in any other manner. We will come to the table with our assets. We have tremendous renewable energy resources that can power green industrialization green sustainable agriculture. We will be coming to the table with millions of enthusiastic, hardworking, innovative, creative young people. We will be coming to the table with our natural and mineral resources that can be used for green technology to power the world's future. We will be coming to the table with a huge 3 billion African market. So we will be coming with assets. And I think, good people, we must make our case unapologetically so that we can occupy our place on the table. Because I am told if you are not on the table, you possibly could be in the menu. <laughs> the commitment by the people of Kenya goes further and deeper. 
When we enacted a new constitution in 2010, we placed the environment at the, at the, at the foundation of our normative and institutional architecture. The fourth paragraph of our constitution's preamble states that our respect for the environment and determination to sustain it was one of the motiv motivating premises in enacting our constitution. Article 42 entrenches a clean and healthy environment as a fund fundamental human right, while Article 67 and 70 set out the framework for the enforcement of environmental rights and obligations. Once we enter the domain of rights and obligations, the respective mandates of the three arms of government automatically follow. Article 21, the state is required as a fund fundamental duty to take legislative policy and other measures required to actualize these rights. Because of the centrality of land in economic and social and cultural and environmental discourse, the Constitution institutes a robust framework for land and environmental governance with a dedicated constitutional commission and the consequential establishment of the Land and Environment Division of the High Court. The Court adjudicates matters related to land, including natural resources and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> As a matter of national policy, Kenya has been involved in environmental diplomacy since the early years of our republic. At the famous Stockholm Conference in 1972, my predecessor and all of us, we impressed on the United Nations for the need to have a dedicated multilateral environmental agency and lobbied to host it in Africa. As a result, the headquarters of the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, is based here in Nairobi. It means it remains the only UN global headquarters in the global south. And for your information, the largest. In 1992, Kenya called the world's attention to the emerging threat of depletion of the ozone layer by toxic emissions and to the buildup of greenhouse gas emissions which posed dangerous consequences on life on earth. Today, we remain strongly committed to our national tradition of championing ecological responsibility throughout the world, but starting here at home. In 2016, Parliament enacted the Climate Change Act, providing us the institutional framework to anchor the national response to climate change. It also legislated the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, which sets out the principles, standards, and procedures for the sustainable use, conservation, and management of the environment and all our natural resources. In December last year, I launched a national green national tree planting drive. The Forest and Rangeland Restoration Initiative aims to grow 15 billion trees by the year 2030, and this will increase the national tree cover from the current 12.3 percent to 30 percent, which will be three times the constitutionally mandated minimum of 10 percent. It will further contribute to our African Landscape Restoration Initiative target, as well as other initiatives to restore degraded lands, forests, and water towers. The Government of Kenya is also taking measures to ensure that every ministry, department, and agency aligns its policies, strategies, programs, and projects with our green agenda. Strengthening the role of judiciaries in addressing climate change in Africa, which is the theme of this symposium, is highly appropriate, and it is also of fundamental significance to our collective readiness to take up global leadership in post-transition economic and industrial order 
and thus usher the world into a future of green, clean, and inclusive uh, prosperity. I congratulate you for holding the third regional symposium on green judiciaries in Africa. I also recognize that you are also holding the third Chief Justice Forum on Environmental Law, as well as the third General Conference of the Africa Judicial Education Network on Environmental Law. Thank you for doing it now and hosting them here in Kenya. We are deeply honored to be your hosts, and I hope that we have lived up to your reputation for legendary, for, to our reputation of legendary hospitality, magical attraction, and delightful experiences. Critically, this event demonstrates beyond any doubt that our judiciaries have come of age. We cannot take this development for granted because our judiciaries will determine whether Africa's institutions exist and are ready to handle the immense mandate that a green future entails for all of us and for the world. Claims, disputes, standards, rights, and responsibilities related to the use of land and natural resources, the institutional framework for financing climate change, carbon trading and exchanges, and transition management frameworks are only some of the areas in which our judiciaries are going to be involved. They must, therefore, pronounce themselves in a manner consistent with the values and aspirations of a continent on the rise. Greening our judiciaries will be inevitably multisectoral and interdisciplinary. Beyond local and international human rights, constitutional environment, trade and economic law, our judiciaries must be exposed to diverse fields such as ecology, economics, agriculture, food systems, trade and finance, carbon markets, energy, and infrastructure, just to mention a few. To fully play your part in arbitrating and auditing Africa's aspirations to lead a new industrial revolution, our judiciaries will have to collaborate across the length and breadth of our continent, engage with diverse knowledge domains, and interact with numerous sectors. They should also formulate a unified understanding of sustainability as the guarantor of prosperity, peace and security, ecological integrity, and human well-being. Your decisions will matter a great deal. They will shape climate governance and enhance environmental justice by promoting accountability for environmental harm and facilitating collective action by all stakeholders. A few days ago, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution that the International Court of Justice renders an opinion obligating the world's biggest emitters to take responsibility for their actions. I equally challenge our judiciary to be creative and imaginative and develop jurisprudence that will enhance climate action based on the polluter pays principle. You must not underestimate your capacity because it leads to positive change. I agree with our Chief Justice statement that our judiciary should not be left behind in this fight for our sustainable future. I therefore urge you to intensify your conscious place in this historic moment and take a decision to have your voices heard for the sake of our generations and the generations yet to be born. You are here to contribute a chapter to the world's history I encourage you to proceed and write a fresh chapter of African resilience, sustainability, and global leadership in a new green industrial age. Together, 
With the rest of Africa, I look forward to receiving a positive report about your robust engagements and fruitful deliberations. It is now my pleasure to declare the third regional symposium on green judiciaries in Africa formally opened. Thank you very much. God bless you. And God bless our great continent. Asante San. Can we just have one more warm applause for our president, Your Excellency? Thank you for those wonderful words. We only have two things we'd like to do in the, this program as we wind up. One is to finish off with the national anthem. Then we have some pictures we'd like taken. And your lords and lady justices, kindly, I request that 